Random House and the House Colophon are registered trademarks of Penguin Random House LLC. Library of Congress cataloging in publication date and names, Westover, Terra, author. Title, Educated, a memoir slash Terra Westover. Description, New York, Random House, 2018 identifiers, LCCN 201-703-7645 ISBN 9780399590504 ISBN 9780399590511 Ebook, Subjects, LCSH, Westover, Terra Family Women Idaho Biography Survivalism Idaho Biography Homeschooling Idaho Anecdotes Women College Students United States Biography Victims of Family Violence Idaho Biography Subculture Idaho Christian Biography Idaho Rural Conditions Anecdotes Idaho Biography Classification LCCCT 3262.I2W47-2018 DDC 270.092 BDC 23 LC record available at lccn.loc.gov 201-703-7645 International ISBN 9780525510673 Ebook ISBN 9780399590511 Random House ebooks.com Book designed by Barbara M. Bachman, adapted for ebook cover illustration, Patrick Svensson v5.2 EP Contents Cover Title Page Copyright Epigraph Authors Note Prologue Part 1 Chapter 1, Choose the Good Chapter 2, The Midwife Chapter 3, Cream Shoes Chapter 4, Apache Women Chapter 5, Honest Dirt Chapter 6, Shield and Buckler Chapter 7, The Lord Will Provide Chapter 8, Tiny Harlots Chapter 9, Perfect in His Generations Chapter 10, Shield of Feathers Chapter 11, Instinct Chapter 12, Fish Eyes Chapter 13, Silence in the Churches Chapter 14, My Feet No Longer Touch Earth Chapter 15, No More a Child Chapter 16, Disloyal Man, Disobedient Heaven Part 2 Chapter 17, To Keep It Holy Chapter 18, Blood and Feathers Chapter 19, In the Beginning Chapter 20, Recitals of the Fathers Chapter 21, Skullcap. Chapter 22, What We Whispered and What We Screamed Chapter 23, I'm From Idaho Chapter 24, A Night, Errant Chapter 25, The Work of Sulphur Chapter 26, Waiting for Moving Water Chapter 27, If I Were a Woman Chapter 28, Pygmalion Chapter 29, Graduation Part 3 Chapter 30, Hand of the Almighty Chapter 31, Tragedy Then Farce Chapter 32, A Brawling Woman in a White House Chapter 33, Sorcery of Physics Chapter 34, The Substance of Things Chapter 35, West of the Sun Chapter 36, Four Long Arms. Whirling Chapter 37, Gambling for Redemption Chapter 38, Family Chapter 39, Watching the Buffalo Chapter 40, Educated Dedication Acknowledgements A note on the text about the author The past is beautiful because one never realizes an emotion at the time. It expands later, and thus we don't have complete emotions about the present, only about the past. Virginia Woolf I believe finally, that education must be conceived as a continuing reconstruction of experience, that the process and the goal of education are one and the same thing. John Dewey T. His story is not about Mormonism. Neither is it about any other form of religious belief. In it there are many types of people, some believers, some not, some kind, some not. The author disputes any correlation, positive or negative, between the two. The following names, listed in alphabetical order, are pseudonyms, Aaron, Audrey, Benjamin, Emily, Aaron, Faye, Jean, Judy, Peter, Robert, Robin, Sadie, Shannon, Sean, Susan, Vanessa. I am standing on the red railway car that sits abandoned next to the barn. The wind soars, whipping my hair across my face and pushing a chill down the open neck of my shirt. The gales are strong this close to the mountain, as if the peak itself is exhaling. Down below, the valley is peaceful, undisturbed. Meanwhile our farm dances, 
The heavy conifer trees sway slowly, while the sagebrush and thistles quiver, bowing before every puff and pocket of air. Behind me a gentle hill slopes upward and stitches itself to the mountain base. If I look up, I can see the dark form of the Indian princess. The hill is paved with wild wheat. If the conifers and sagebrush are soloists, the wheat field is a corps de ballet, each stem following all the rest in bursts of movement, a million ballerinas bending, one after the other, as great gales dent their golden heads. The shape of that dent lasts only a moment, and is as close as anyone gets to seeing wind. Turning toward our house on the hillside, I see movements of a different kind, tall shadows stiffly pushing through the currents. My brothers are awake, testing the weather. I imagine my mother at the stove, hovering over bran pancakes. I picture my father hunched by the back door, lacing his steel-toed boots and threading his call-used hands into welding gloves. On the highway below, the school bus rolls past without stopping. I am only seven, but I understand that it is this fact, more than any other, that makes my family different, we don't go to school. Dad worries that the government will force us to go but it can't, because it doesn't know about us. Four of my parents' seven children don't have birth certificates. We have no medical records because we were born at home and have never seen a doctor or nurse asterisk we have no school records because we've never set foot in a classroom. When I am nine, I will be issued a delayed certificate of birth, but at this moment, according to the state of Idaho and the federal government, I do not exist. Of course I did exist. I had grown up preparing for the days of abomination, watching for the sun to darken, for the moon to drip as if with blood. I spent my summers bottling peaches and my winters rotating supplies. When the world of men failed, my family would continue on, unaffected. I had been educated in the rhythms of the mountain, rhythms in which change was never fundamental, only cyclical. The same sun appeared each morning, swept over the valley and dropped behind the peak. The snows that fell in winter always melted in the spring. Our lives were a cycle the cycle of the day, the cycle of the season circles of perpetual change that, when complete, meant nothing had changed at all. I believed my family was a part of this immortal pattern, that we were, in some sense, eternal. But eternity belonged only to the mountain. There's a story my father used to tell about the peak. She was a grand old thing, a cathedral of a mountain. The range had other mountains, taller, more imposing, but Buck's Peak was the most finely crafted. Its base spanned a mile, its dark form swelling out of the earth and rising into a flawless spire. From a distance, you could see the impression of a woman's body on the mountain face, her legs formed of huge ravines, her hair a spray of pines fanning over the northern ridge. Her stance was commanding, one leg thrust forward in a powerful movement, more stride than step. My father called her the Indian Princess. She emerged each year when the snows began to melt, facing south, watching the buffalo return to the valley. Dad said the nomadic Indians had watched for her appearance as a sign of spring, a signal the mountain was thawing, winter was over, and it was time to come home. All my father's stories were about our mountain, our valley, our jagged little patch of Idaho. He never told me what to do if I left the mountain, if I crossed oceans and continents and found myself in strange terrain, where I could no longer search the horizon for the princess. He never told me how I'd know when it was time to come home. Asterisk except for my sister Audrey, who broke both an arm and a leg when she was young. She was taken to get a cast. Part 1 M Why Strongest Memory Is Not a Memory It's something I imagined, then came to remember as if it had happened. The memory was formed when I was five, just before I turned six, from a story my father told in such detail that I and my brothers and sister had each conjured our own cinematic version, with gunfire and shouts. Mine had crickets. That's the sound I hear as my family huddles in the kitchen, lights off, hiding from the feds who've surrounded the house. A woman reaches for a glass of water and her silhouette is lighted by the moon. A shot echoes like the lash of a whip and she falls. In my memory it's always mother who falls, 
and she has a baby in her arms. The baby doesn't make sense I'm the youngest of my mother's seven children but like I said, none of this happened. A year after my father told us that story, we gathered one evening to hear him read aloud from Isaiah, a prophecy about Emmanuel. He sat on our mustard-colored sofa, a large Bible open in his lap. Mother was next to him. The rest of us were strewn across the shaggy brown carpet. Butter and honey shall he eat, Dad droned, low and monotone, weary from a long day hauling scrap. That he may know to refuse the evil, and choose the good. There was a heavy pause. We sat quietly. My father was not a tall man but he was able to command a room. He had a presence about him, the solemnity of an oracle. His hands were thick and leathery the hands of a man who'd been hard at work all his life and they grasped the Bible firmly. He read the passage aloud a second time, then a third, then a fourth. With each repetition the pitch of his voice climbed higher. His eyes, which moments before had been swollen with fatigue, were now wide and alert. There was a divine doctrine here, he said. He would inquire of the Lord. The next morning Dad purged our fridge of milk, yogurt, and cheese, and that evening when he came home, his truck was loaded with fifty gallons of honey. Isaiah doesn't say which is evil, butter or honey, Dad said, grinning as my brothers lugged the white tubs to the basement. But if you ask, the Lord will tell you. When Dad read the verse to his mother, she laughed in his face. I got some pennies in my purse, she said. You better take them. They'll be all the sense you got. Grandma had a thin, angular face and an endless store of faux Indian jewelry, all silver and turquoise, which hung in clumps from her spindly neck and fingers. Because she lived down the hill from us, near the highway, we called her Grandma Down the Hill. This was to distinguish her from our mother's mother, who we called Grandmover in town because she lived 15 miles south, in the only town in the county, which had a single stoplight and a grocery store. Dad and his mother got along like two cats with their tails tied together. They could talk for a week and not agree about anything, but they were tethered by their devotion to the mountain. My father's family had been living at the base of Buck's Peak for half a century. Grandma's daughters had married and moved away, but my father stayed, building a shabby yellow house, which he would never quite finish, just up the hill from his mother's, at the base of the mountain, and plunking a junkyard one of several next to her manicured lawn. They argued daily, about the mess from the junkyard but more often about us kids. Grandma thought we should be in school and not, as she put it, roaming the mountain like savages. Dad said public school was a ploy by the government to lead children away from God. I may as well surrender my kids to the devil himself, he said, as send them down the road to that school. God told Dad to share the revelation with the people who lived and farmed in the shadow of Buck's Peak. On Sundays, nearly everyone gathered at the church, a hickory-colored chapel just off the highway with the small, restrained steeple common to Mormon churches. Dad cornered fathers as they left their pews. He started with his cousin Jim, who listened good-naturedly while Dad waved his Bible and explained the sinfulness of milk. Jim grinned then clapped Dad on the shoulder and said no righteous God would deprive a man of homemade strawberry ice cream on a hot summer afternoon. Jim's wife tugged on his arm. As he slid past us I caught a whiff of manure. Then I remembered, the big dairy farm a mile north of Buck's Peak, that was Jim's. After Dad took up preaching against milk, Grandma jammed her fridge full of it. She and Grandpa only drank skim but pretty soon it was all there two percent, whole, even chocolate. She seemed to believe this was an important line to hold. Breakfast became a test of loyalty. Every morning, my family sat around a large table of reworked red oak and ate either seven-grain cereal with honey and molasses, or seven-grain pancakes, also with honey and molasses. Because there were nine of us, the pancakes were never cooked all the way through. I didn't mind the cereal if I could soak it in milk, letting the cream gather up the grist and seep into the pellets, but since the revelation we'd been having it with water. It was like eating a bowl of mud. 
It wasn't long before I began to think of all that milk spoiling in grandma's fridge. Then I got into the habit of skipping breakfast each morning and going straight to the barn. I'd slop the pigs and fill the trough for the cows and horses, then I'd hop over the corral fence, loop around the barn and step through grandma's side door. On one such morning, as I sat at the counter watching grandma pour a bowl of cornflakes, she said, how would you like to go to school? I wouldn't like it, I said. How do you know, she barked. You ain't never tried it? She poured the milk and handed me the bowl, then she perched at the bar, directly across from me, and watched as I shoveled spoonfuls into my mouth. We're leaving tomorrow for Arizona, she told me, but I already knew. She and Grandpa always went to Arizona when the weather began to turn. Grandpa said he was too old for Idaho winters, the cold put an ache in his bones. Get yourself up real early, Grandma said, around five, and we'll take you with us. Put you in school. I shifted on my stool. I tried to imagine school but couldn't. Instead I pictured Sunday school, which I attended each week and which I hated. A boy named Aaron had told all the girls that I couldn't read because I didn't go to school, and now none of them would talk to me. Dad said I can go. I said. No, Grandma said. But we'll be long gone by the time he realizes you're missing. She set my bowl in the sink and gazed out the window. Grandma was a force of nature impatient, aggressive, self-possessed. To look at her was to take a step back. She dyed her hair black and this intensified her already severe features, especially her eyebrows, which she smeared on each morning in thick, inky arches. She drew them too large and this made her face seem stretched. They were also drawn too high and draped the rest of her features into an expression of boredom, almost sarcasm. You should be in school, she said. Won't dad just make you bring me back? I said. Your dad can't make me do a damned thing. Grandma stood, squaring herself. If he wants you, he'll have to come get you. She hesitated, and for a moment looked ashamed. I talked to him yesterday. He won't be able to fetch you back for a long while. He's behind on that shed he's building in town. He can't pack up and drive to Arizona, not while the weather holds and he and the boys can work long days. Grandma's scheme was well plotted. Dad always worked from sunup until sundown in the weeks before the first snow, trying to stockpile enough money from hauling scrap and building barns to outlast the winter, when jobs were scarce. Even if his mother ran off with his youngest child, he wouldn't be able to stop working, not until the forklift was encased in ice. I'll need to feed the animals before we go, I said. He'll notice I'm gone for sure if the cows break through the fence looking for water. I didn't sleep that night. I sat on the kitchen floor and watched the hours tick by. 1 a.m. 2. 3. At 4 I stood and put my boots by the back door. They were caked in manure, and I was sure Grandma wouldn't let them into her car. I pictured them on her porch, abandoned, while I ran off shoeless to Arizona. I imagined what would happen when my family discovered I was missing. My brother Richard and I often spent whole days on the mountain, so it was likely no one would notice until sundown, when Richard came home for dinner and I didn't. I pictured my brothers pushing out the door to search for me. They'd try the junkyard first, hefting iron slabs in case some stray sheet of metal had shifted and pinned me. Then they'd move outward, sweeping the farm, crawling up trees and into the barn attic. Finally, they'd turn to the mountain. It would be past dusk by then that moment just before night sets in, when the landscape is visible only as darkness and lighter darkness, and you feel the world around you more than you see it. I imagined my brothers spreading over the mountain, searching the black forests. No one would talk, everyone's thoughts would be the same. Things could go horribly wrong on the mountain. Cliffs appeared suddenly. Feral horses, belonging to my grandfather, ran wild over thick banks of water hemlock, and there were more than a few rattlesnakes. We'd done this search before when a calf went missing from the barn. 
in the valley you'd find an injured animal, on the mountain, a dead one. I imagined mother standing by the back door, her eyes sweeping the dark ridge, when my father came home to tell her they hadn't found me. My sister, Audrey, would suggest that someone ask grandma, and mother would say grandma had left that morning for Arizona. Those words would hang in the air for a moment, then everyone would know where I'd gone. I imagined my father's face, his dark eyes shrinking, his mouth clamping into a frown as he turned to my mother. You think she chose to go? Low and sorrowful, his voice echoed. Then it was drowned out by sounds from another conjured remembrance crickets, then gunfire, then silence. The event was a famous one, I would later learn like Wounded Knee or Waco but when my father first told us the story, it felt like no one in the world knew about it except us. It began near the end of canning season, which other kids probably called summer. My family always spent the warm months bottling fruit for storage, which Dad said we'd need in the days of abomination. One evening, Dad was uneasy when he came in from the junkyard. He paced the kitchen during dinner, hardly touching a bite. We had to get everything in order, he said. There was little time. We spent the next day boiling and skinning peaches. By sundown we'd filled dozens of mason jars, which were set out in perfect rows, still warm from the pressure cooker. Dad surveyed our work, counting the jars and muttering to himself, then he turned to mother and said, it's not enough. That night dad called a family meeting, and we gathered around the kitchen table, because it was wide and long, and could seat all of us. We had a right to know what we were up against, he said. He was standing at the head of the table, the rest of us perched on benches, studying the thick planks of red oak. There's a family not far from here, Dad said. They're freedom fighters. They wouldn't let the government brainwash their kids in them public schools, so the feds came after them. Dad exhaled, long and slow. The feds surrounded the family's cabin, kept them locked in there for weeks, and when a hungry child, a little boy, snuck out to go hunting, the feds shot him dead. I scanned my brothers. I'd never seen fear on Luke's face before. They're still in the cabin, Dad said. They keep the lights off, and they crawl on the floor, away from the doors and windows. I don't know how much food they got. Might be they'll starve before the feds give up. No one spoke. Eventually Luke, who was 12, asked if we could help. No, Dad said. Nobody can. They're trapped in their own home. But they got their guns, you can bet that's why the feds ain't charged in. He paused to sit, folding himself onto the low bench in slow, stiff movements. He looked old to my eyes, worn out. We can't help them, but we can help ourselves. When the feds come to Buck's Peak, we'll be ready. That night, Dad dragged a pile of old army bags up from the basement. He said they were our head for the hills bags. We spent that night packing them with supplies herbal medicines, water purifiers, flint, and steel. Dad had bought several boxes of military MREs meals ready to eat and we put as many as we could fit into our packs, imagining the moment when, having fled the house and hiding ourselves in the wild plum trees near the creek, we'd eat them. Some of my brothers stowed guns in their packs but I had only a small knife, and even so my pack was as big as me by the time we'd finished. I asked Luke to hoist it onto a shelf in my closet, but Dad told me to keep it low, where I could fetch it quick, so I slept with it in my bed. I practiced slipping the bag onto my back and running with it I didn't want to be left behind. I imagined our escape, a midnight flight to the safety of the princess. The mountain, I understood, was our ally. To those who knew her she could be kind, but to intruders she was pure treachery, and this would give us an advantage. Then again, if we were going to take cover on the mountain when the feds came, I didn't understand why we were canning all these peaches. We couldn't haul a thousand heavy mason jars up the peak. Or did we need the peaches so we could bunker down in the house, like the weavers, and fight it out? Fighting it out seemed likely, 
especially a few days later when dad came home with more than a dozen military surplus rifles, mostly SKSs, their thin silver bayonets folded neatly under their barrels. The guns arrived in narrow tin boxes and were packed in COSMOLINE, a brownish substance the consistency of lard that had to be stripped away. After they'd been cleaned, my brother Tyler chose one and set it on a sheet of black plastic, which he folded over the rifle, sealing it with yards of silvery duct tape. Hoisting the bundle onto his shoulder, he carried it down the hill and dropped it next to the red railroad car. Then he began to dig. When the hole was wide and deep, he dropped the rifle into it, and I watched him cover it with dirt, his muscles swelling from the exertion, his jaw clenched. Soon after, Dad bought a machine to manufacture bullets from spent cartridges. Now we could last longer in a standoff, he said. I thought of my head for the hills bag, waiting in my bed, and of the rifle hidden near the rail car, and began to worry about the bullet making machine. It was bulky and bolted to an iron workstation in the basement. If we were taken by surprise, I figured we wouldn't have time to fetch it. I wondered if we should bury it, too, with the rifle. We kept on bottling peaches. I don't remember how many days passed or how many jars we'd added to our stores before Dad told us more of the story. Randy Weaver's been shot, Dad said, his voice thin and erratic. He left the cabin to fetch his son's body, and the feds shot him. I'd never seen my father cry, but now tears were dripping in a steady stream from his nose. He didn't wipe them, just let them spill onto his shirt. His wife heard the shot and ran to the window holding their baby. Then came the second shot. Mother was sitting with her arms folded, one hand across her chest, the other clamped over her mouth. I stared at our speckled linoleum while dad told us how the baby had been lifted from its mother's arms, its face smeared with her blood. Until that moment, some part of me had wanted the feds to come, had craved the adventure. Now I felt real fear. I pictured my brothers crouching in the dark, their sweaty hands slipping down their rifles. I pictured mother, tired and parched, drawing back away from the window. I pictured myself lying flat on the floor, still and silent, listening to the sharp chirp of crickets in the field. Then I saw mother stand and reach for the kitchen tap. A white flash, the roar of gunfire, and she fell. I leapt to catch the baby. Dad never told us the end of the story. We didn't have a TV or radio, so perhaps he never learned how it ended himself. The last thing I remember him saying about it was, next time, it could be us. Those words would stay with me. I would hear their echo in the chirp of crickets, in the squish of peaches dropping into a glass jar, in the metallic chink of an SKS being cleaned. I would hear them every morning when I passed the railroad car and paused over the chickweed and bull thistle growing where Tyler had buried the rifle. Long after Dad had forgotten about the revelation in Isaiah, and Mother was again hefting plastic jugs of Western Family 2% into the fridge, I would remember the weavers. IT was almost 5 a.m. I returned to my room, my head full of crickets and gunfire. In the lower bunk, Audrey was snoring, a low, contented hum that invited me to do the same. Instead I climbed up to my bed, crossed my legs and looked out the window. Five passed. Then six. At seven, Grandma appeared and I watched her pace up and down her patio, turning every few moments to gaze up the hill at our house. Then she and Grandpa stepped into their car and pulled onto the highway. When the car was gone, I got out of bed and ate a bowl of bran with water. Outside I was greeted by Luke's goat, Kamikaze, who nibbled my shirt as I walked to the barn. I passed the go-kart Richard was building from an old lawnmower. I slopped the pigs, filled the trough and moved Grandpa's horses to a new pasture. After I'd finished I climbed the railway car and looked out over the valley. It was easy to pretend the car was moving, speeding away, that any moment the valley might disappear behind me. I'd spent hours playing that fantasy through in my head but today the reel wouldn't take. I turned west, away from the fields, and faced the peak. The princess was always brightest in spring, 
just after the conifers emerged from the snow, their deep green needle seeming almost black against the tawny browns of soil and bark. It was autumn now. I could still see her but she was fading, the reds and yellows of a dying summer obscured her dark form. Soon it would snow. In the valley that first snow would melt but on the mountain it would linger, burying the princess until spring, when she would reappear, watchful. Do you have calendula, the midwife said. I also need lobelia and witch hazel. She was sitting at the kitchen counter, watching mother rummage through our birchwood cabinets. An electric scale sat on the counter between them, and occasionally mother would use it to weigh dried leaves. It was spring. There was a morning chill despite the bright sunlight. I made a fresh batch of calendula last week, mother said. Tara, run and fetch it. I retrieved the tincture, and my mother packed it in a plastic grocery bag with the dried herbs. Anything else? Mother laughed. The pitch was high, nervous. The midwife intimidated her, and when intimidated my mother took on a weightless quality, whisking about every time the midwife made one of her slow, solid movements. The midwife surveyed her list. That will do. She was a short, plump woman in her late forties, with eleven children and a russet-colored wart on her chin. She had the longest hair I'd ever seen, a cascade the color of field mice that fell to her knees when she took it out of its tight bun. Her features were heavy, her voice thick with authority. She had no license, no certificates. She was a midwife entirely by the power of her own say-so, which was more than enough. Mother was to be her assistant. I remember watching them that first day, comparing them. Mother with her rose petal skin and her hair curled into soft waves that bounced about her shoulders. Her eyelids shimmered. Mother did her makeup every morning, but if she didn't have time she'd apologize all day, as if by not doing it, she had inconvenienced everyone. The midwife looked as though she hadn't given a thought to her appearance in a decade, and the way she carried herself made you feel foolish for having noticed. The midwife nodded goodbye, her arms full of mother's herbs. The next time the midwife came she brought her daughter Maria, who stood next to her mother, imitating her movements, with a baby wedged against her wiry nine-year-old frame. I stared hopefully at her. I hadn't met many other girls like me, who didn't go to school. I edged closer, trying to draw her attention, but she was wholly absorbed in listening to her mother, who was explaining how cramp bark and mother wort should be administered to treat post-birth contractions. Maria's head bobbed in agreement, her eyes never left her mother's face. I trudged down the hall to my room, alone, but when I turned to shut the door she was standing in it, still toting the baby on her hip. He was a meaty box of flesh, and her torso bent sharply at the waist to offset his bulk. Are you going, she said. I didn't understand the question. I always go, she said. Have you seen a baby get born? No I have, lots of times. Do you know what it means when a baby comes breach? No I said it like an apology. The first time mother assisted with a birth she was gone for two days. Then she wafted through the back door, so pale she seemed translucent, and drifted to the couch, where she stayed, trembling. It was awful, she whispered. Even Judy said she was scared. Mother closed her eyes. She didn't look scared. Mother rested for several minutes, until she regained some color, then she told the story. The labor had been long, grueling, and when the baby finally came the mother had torn, and badly. There was blood everywhere. The hemorrhage wouldn't stop. That's when mother realized the umbilical cord had wrapped around the baby's throat. He was purple, so still mother thought he was dead. As mother recounted these details, the blood drained from her face until she sat, pale as an egg, her arms wrapped around herself. Audrey made chamomile tea and we put our mother to bed. When dad came home that night, mother told him the same story. I can't do it, she said. Judy can, but I can't. Dad put an arm on her shoulder. This is a calling from the Lord, he said. 
and sometimes the Lord asks for hard things. Mother didn't want to be a midwife. Midwifery had been Dad's idea, one of his schemes for self-reliance. There was nothing he hated more than our being dependent on the government. Dad said one day we would be completely off the grid. As soon as he could get the money together, he planned to build a pipeline to bring water down from the mountain, and after that he'd install solar panels all over the farm. That way we'd have water and electricity in the end of days, when everyone else was drinking from puddles and living in darkness. Mother was an herbalist so she could tend our health, and if she learned to midwife she would be able to deliver the grandchildren when they came along. The midwife came to visit mother a few days after the first birth. She brought Maria, who again followed me to my room. It's too bad your mother got a bad one her first time, she said, smiling. The next one will be easier. A few weeks later, this prediction was tested. It was midnight. Because we didn't have a phone, the midwife called Grandma down the hill, who walked up the hill, tired and ornery, and barked that it was time for mother to go play doctor. She stayed only minutes but woke the whole house. Why you people can't just go to a hospital like everyone else is beyond me, she shouted, slamming the door on her way out. Mother retrieved her overnight bag and the tackle box she'd filled with dark bottles of tincture, then she walked slowly out the door. I was anxious and slept badly, but when mother came home the next morning, hair deranged and dark circles under her eyes, her lips were parted in a wide smile. It was a girl, she said. Then she went to bed and slept all day. Months passed in this way, mother leaving the house at all hours and coming home, trembling, relieved to her core that it was over. By the time the leaves started to fall she'd helped with a dozen births. By the end of winter, several dozen. In the spring she told my father she'd had enough, that she could deliver a baby if she had to, if it was the end of the world. Now she could stop. Dad's face sank when she said this. He reminded her that this was God's will, that it would bless our family. You need to be a midwife he said. You need to deliver a baby on your own. Mother shook her head. I can't, she said. Besides, who would hire me when they could hire Judy? She jinxed herself, thrown her gauntlet before God. Soon after, Maria told me her father had a new job in Wyoming. Mom says your mother should take over, Maria said. A thrilling image took shape in my imagination, of me in Maria's role, the midwife's daughter, confident, knowledgeable. But when I turned to look at my mother standing next to me, the image turned to vapor. Midwifery was not illegal in the state of Idaho, but it had not yet been sanctioned. If a delivery went wrong, a midwife might face charges for practicing medicine without a license, if things went very wrong, she could face criminal charges for manslaughter, even prison time. Few women would take such a risk, so midwives were scarce, on the day Judy left for Wyoming, mother became the only midwife for a hundred miles. Women with swollen bellies began coming to the house and begging mother to deliver their babies. Mother crumpled at the thought. One woman sat on the edge of our faded yellow sofa, her eyes cast downward, as she explained that her husband was out of work and they didn't have money for a hospital. Mother sat quietly, eyes focused, lips tight, her whole expression momentarily solid. Then the expression dissolved and she said, in her small voice, I'm not a midwife, just an assistant. The woman returned several times, perching on our sofa again and again, describing the uncomplicated births of her other children. Whenever Dad saw the woman's car from the junkyard, he'd often come into the house, quietly, through the back door, on the pretense of getting water, then he'd stand in the kitchen taking slow, silent sips, his ear bent toward the living room. Each time the woman left dad could hardly contain his excitement, so that finally, succumbing to either the woman's desperation or to dad's elation, or to both, mother gave way. The birth went smoothly. Then the woman had a friend who was also pregnant, and mother delivered her baby as well. Then that woman had a friend. Mother took on an assistant. 
Before long she was delivering